Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 2019 ICLR Hurricane Briefing. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. You have joined the presentation listening using your computer speaker system by default. If you prefer to join over the telephone, select the arrow next to the mute, a mute icon on the bottom of the Zoom screen. Select leave auto, computer audio and then select phone call and follow the prompt to dial in. You will also have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenter by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. And now I'd like to introduce Glenn McGilvery from ICLR to say a few words. Glenn? Thank you, Tracy. Appreciate that very much. Hello, everybody. It's Glenn McGilvery, Managing Director of the Institute for Catastrophic Loss Reduction. Welcome to this year's uh, webinar forecast for the North Atlantic Basin hurricane season. Um, if you missed it, we did our annual uh, wildfire season forecast on May 17th. The slides are available on our website and the replay of the webinar is available on our YouTube channel. You get to those two things pretty quickly uh, right from ICLR.org. Um, also, I want to note that uh, tomorrow is a regular Friday forum, so we've had three events this month, very busy. Tomorrow's Friday forum is entitled Modeling a Future Flood Risk Across Canada Under Climate Change. That will be led by Dr. Slobodin and Simonovic, who is our um, Director of Engineering Studies. So with that, I want to uh, pass the floor over to Bob Robichaud. I've been trying to figure out how long Bob is doing this, has been doing this for us for. It's been over 10 years anyway. We're very fortunate to have Bob with us again. So Bob, uh, go ahead. Thanks so much. All right, thank you very much, Glenn, um, and welcome everybody to uh, this year's uh, briefing. Uh, what I like to do is uh, typically kind of follow the same kind of um, a format. Uh, since we only get these types of storms over a certain uh, time of the year, uh, I like to do a quick review of tropical cyclones, and uh, then uh, I'll go into talking a little bit about what happened uh, last season. Uh, before we look ahead at what might occur in 2019, uh, there's already a, a number of outlooks that are, have been issued for the upcoming season. So we'll uh, take a look at, uh, at uh, the main one that we look at, and then we'll just finish up by looking at some, um, uh, some resources to, uh, on how to follow these storms during the actual season. So tropical cyclones, when we talk about a tropical cyclone, um, it's basically a generic term for all um, the type of storms that we're talking about, such as hurricanes, tropical storms, typhoons. Those are all the same exact uh, storm. They form in the same manner. Uh, they just get different names depending on which ocean basin that they're in. Uh, so for the uh, eastern uh, Pacific and the Atlantic, uh, we call them hurricanes, um, and they form over the warm tropical waters, uh, and the map that you see at the bottom there is all the tropical uh, cyclones, um, actually hurricanes, only the ones that actually made it to hurricane strength, uh, that we have on record uh, in a huge database called the, uh, called the HERDAT database, and it's basically a database of all the hurricanes that we have documented since 1842. Um, and the purpose of these storms is to take excess energy that's uh, stored in the ocean in the form of heat and dissipate that into the atmosphere. So the hurricanes actually do have a purpose. Uh, and you'll see, um, so try and uh, keep this image in mind because we're going to look at uh, water temperatures here shortly and you'll see um, the correlation between where these storms form and water temperatures over, um, over the different ocean basins. So from a climatological standpoint, um, typically early in the season, which runs from June 1st to the end of November, uh, we tend to see these storms develop in the western part of the Atlantic, uh, in the Caribbean, and the Gulf of Mexico, uh, and that gradually propagates eastward over the course of the season, which uh, once you hit the end of August into September, uh, September being the peak month of hurricane season because that's when those water temperatures actually peak. And then once uh, we get into some of those colder air masses, even down in the, in the, the tropics where it starts to cool, um, uh, so the 
we tend to kind of see a decrease in hurricane activity and that area of preferred formation shifts back to the western part of the Atlantic and typically in November we can still get a few storms but uh, most of the activity uh, happens in the month of September. So the way these things uh, develop, if you look at a cross section of, uh, of a hurricane, you get these successive bands of um, stronger winds and precipitation uh, as you head towards the, uh, the final band before you reach the center of the storm, and that's actually called the eye wall. In the lower levels of the atmosphere, you have winds or air that is rotating inward towards the center of the storm. All that air has to go somewhere, so most of it actually goes up, and most of it actually flows out from the storm. So you have an outflow, it's rotating um, clockwise at the top of the storm, yet it's rotating and, and outward from the storm at the top, yet it's rotating counterclockwise and in towards the storm uh, in the uh, lower levels of the atmosphere. So a lot of that air flows in, it goes up, and then it flows out the top. Some of it actually sinks in towards the center of the storm and whenever you have sinking air, uh, that air warms and because, because of uh, compression and then once that, uh, once that air begins to warm, it starts to dry and that's why the, uh, the center of these, especially the stronger hurricanes, uh, are clear quite often right to the uh, surface of the, uh, the ocean because of that sinking air motion. Now we classify these storms based on their wind speed and there's a lot of discussion about how we should be classifying these storms, uh, especially given some storms in the last few years where um, there's been uh, a lot of damage and, and uh, fatalities as a result of uh, inland freshwater flooding. Um, there's there's, um, there's, like I say, there's a, a, a kind of discussion going on as to whether we should actually uh, change the Saffir-Simpson scale, but in, in fact, what we need is an objective way to classify these storms. And it turns out that the only way to do that is to, um, to consider the, the wind speed as the main um, uh, classification uh, parameter for these types of storms. So we classify them by wind speed, uh, so when these storms develop and the winds um, exceed 63 kilometers per hour, that's when the storm is given a name and it's uh, classified as a tropical storm. If the winds reach 119 kilometers per hour, that's when it gets classified as a hurricane. And if the winds reach 178 kilometers per hour, that's when it gets classified as a major hurricane. And so you have category one, two uh, being uh, simply hurricanes and three, four, and five being major hurricanes. So one of the things that we obviously deal with uh, in the more northern latitudes, whether it's uh, the New England states of the US or eastern parts of uh, Canada, uh, is that we often see these storms uh, become what we call post-tropical. Uh, so we start with uh, a, a name storm, a tropical cyclone, like you see on the uh, uh, on the bottom image here. This is a, a satellite image of Hurricane Irma back in 2017. Now, as I mentioned, the tropical cyclone is fueled by the warm water. It's characterized by very slow movement in the tropics, and the 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 main hazards are pretty symmetrical. So the wind and the rain around the center are pretty symmetrical, whereas a non tropical cyclone like uh, like a severe winter storm, uh, an example of which we have uh, down there, which was the, uh, the winter storm of January 2018, um, <clears throat> rather than, than being fueled by the warm waters, fueled by the contrast in air temperature between northern latitudes and southern latitudes. Uh, these tend to move a lot faster and are very asymmetric where you have the precipitation on one side and uh, some of the stronger winds on the other side. So what happens to tropical cyclones when they reach northern latitudes quite often is that they transform themselves from a tropical system or purely tropical system to uh, that second type of storm, the non-tropical, um, and that's what we call a post-tropical storm. And that's, that's what we get uh, uh, in eastern Canada or uh, 
or the the New England states uh, quite a bit more than say a pure tropical uh, cyclone. It's either in the process of being uh, of becoming post tropical, or it's already become post tropical by the time it reaches here. Now that doesn't necessarily say anything about the intensity. These storms, these post tropical storms, can still be very very intense. Um, but they, they just have a different structure by the time they reach here. So if we look at uh, what we experienced last year when we did the briefing last year, the, um, the outlook uh, was just uh, issued um, just a few days prior, and that outlook called for 10 to 16 named storms, uh, four to nine of those becoming hurricanes, and one to four reaching major hurricane status. And you can see that the actual numbers for last year were 15 named storms, eight hurricanes, and two major hurricanes. So those numbers fit in quite nicely with uh, the predicted values for last year. And uh, the, we, there's a number of, uh, we'll go through these storms here uh, uh, in a second, but the, the two major hurricanes from last year, uh, both of them had very severe but different impacts on, uh, on the U.S. Florence was um, uh, the, the most of the impacts with Florence uh, were as a result of the water, so storm surge and of course that inland flooding. Uh, and then with Michael, Michael was uh, still intensifying when it made landfall, and most of the damage that occurred as a result of Michael was the storm surge and all, but also the wind as well. Uh, so those are the storms from last year. So Florence and Michael have been uh, retired from the list of names, so we won't see uh, those names pop up anymore in, in our uh, recurring list of hurricane names, which we rotate through every six years. So looking at the track maps from last year, you can see that uh, other than the western part of the Gulf of Mexico, pretty much the entire Atlantic Basin uh, saw its share of, uh, of hurricanes either forming or tracking through there. Uh, the purple tracks, of course, are the, the major hurricanes, so with Florence and, uh, and Michael. And for here in Canada, we, uh, we had our first uh, landfalling storm in a few years, but impacts were, were fairly minimal. Uh, we had uh, Hurricane uh, Burl uh, that uh, became a hurricane, uh, and then... Um, uh, and then uh, weekend, and then Chris also became a hurricane uh, and actually made landfall in Newfoundland as a post-tropical storm. Um, and uh, like I say, the damage was, uh, was minimal. The, there was some heavy rain being reported and some gusty winds on the Avalon Peninsula, but uh, it takes a little bit more than that to result in significant impacts in that part of, uh, of the province. Um, so last year we had another um, uh, early start to the year. We had uh, Tropical Storm um, Alberto um, that became the first storm of the year before the official start of the season. So it formed on May 25th. Uh, again, uh, this one here had non-tropical origin. So it started as an existing low pressure system that acquired tropical characteristics rather than a pure tropical storm that started from nothing. Uh, be that as it may, there were still 18 direct fatalities as a result of uh, Alberto. Uh, Burl, again, is one that went through rapid intensification. This is the, this is the problem that um, we as forecasters are, are concerned about, is this rapid intensification of these storms, uh, which tend to be very, very difficult to predict, uh, both the intensity and the timing of uh, when these storms start to rapidly intensify. This, uh, this one did rapidly intensify, although it was uh, still out to sea. Uh, it actually made it over some cooler waters before regenerating. But in the meantime, that's when Chris developed uh, and uh, reached Category 2 status before, as I mentioned, making landfall uh, in the eastern part of Newfoundland. Then uh, we had Tropical Storm Debbie and Ernesto, both uh, formed as a as entities in August, uh, again from non-tropical or origins, but uh, there were no uh, impacts reported with either Debbie or Ernesto. And then we had Florence. Florence uh, formed on the last day of August and became the first major hurricane of uh, 2018 in early September. 
Uh, it weakened. It actually moved over an area of, uh, of fairly high wind shear, uh, and it weakened uh, back down to a tropical storm before once it kept uh, it kept moving, it started to to, uh, to to move away from that area of wind shear and re-intensified again. Uh, once again, reached uh, major hurricane status and then uh, moved towards the Carolinas, where it slowed down, weakened to a Category One, and then made landfall near Wrightsville Beach uh, early on September 14th. So the 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 key thing with um, Florence is the fact that it slowed down as much as it did and resulted in uh, in the record flooding that we saw in that part of the Carolinas. So what you see here is essentially um, a satellite image, a high resolution satellite image of um, the storm. And it starts off at night and you can see actually the light from the cities uh, in the southeastern part of the U.S. And if you if you notice closely the um, the you can actually see the difference between uh, the uh, the clouds at the higher levels of the atmosphere, which I'm going to try and annotate here. So the outflow at the top is flowing out from the storm, and you can see the cl these clouds going in in one direction. The wispier clouds are the high clouds, whereas this low these low clouds down here are actually rotating in towards the center so if i get this going again you can see how the higher cloud is actually moving uh, away and out from the storm um, in a clockwise direction while the lower cloud is actually uh, rotating inward. So this this new satellite that was uh, launched a couple of years ago now uh, is giving us just some amazing imagery on some of these hurricanes that are um, not just uh, affecting land, but the ones that are over the water. So it, it's given us a really good vantage point uh, to see how these storms are uh, are developing. So I'm just going to clear this. So Florence produced extensive wind damage along right along the North Carolina coast. Again, um, most of uh, uh, of the the damage was caused uh, the wind damage was was caused by down trees, so power outages and that sort of thing. Um, there was a fairly significant storm surge of two to four meters, uh, but the story with the Florence definitely was the rainfall, uh, and they got uh, on the whole. Uh, North Carolina, South Carolina area got between 500 and 800 millimeters of rain with 912.6 millimeters uh, being the peak rainfall that was observed at uh, Elizabethtown, North Carolina. Uh, the peak wind uh, recorded with the storm, uh, again, right at the coast, and it was 171 kilometers per hour. Uh, so uh, you can probably remember all the, the, the news coverage on the flooding associated with Florence. Um, so a number of fatalities uh, directly related to the uh, the flooding and twenty four billion dollars uh, in damage and some of the pictures here quite striking this uh, the picture here on the right uh, was basically this uh, um, this highway was entirely covered in water and once that water receded the fish stayed behind and and you ended up with fish thrown uh, along the entire part of this section of highway. Uh, so some very odd images uh, f uh, that we've seen from some of these storms over the years. So once we got into the peak of hurricane season, uh, around the middle of the month of September, uh, we had uh, Tropical Storm Gordon. Um, Gordon uh, became a tropical storm on September 3rd and then uh, quickly made landfall the day after. Uh, now produced uh, quite a bit of rain along the uh, uh, Florida Panhandle area with uh, over 300 millimeters of rain. Uh, there were four fatalities, again, mostly re related to uh, flooding, and up to $250 million in damages there. Uh, Helene became a hurricane on September 9th and almost reached Category 2, but stayed over the ocean, so not much in the way of impacts there. Isaac also became a hurricane on September 9th, uh, but no fatalities, but there were some reports of... Uh, some heavy surf and mudslides over uh, parts of the Caribbean uh, with Isaac. Uh, 
And then we had Tropical Storm Joyce. Uh, that was another storm that uh, formed from a non-tropical origin. So it had a, an existing uh, low pressure system that acquired tropical uh, characteristics, or what we call a subtropical storm. Um, <laughs> again, no damage reported uh, there. Uh, tropical Storm Kirk formed off the uh, coast of Africa in late September and produced some heavy rain and floods, uh, power outages in Barbados. Uh, we had Leslie. Leslie was our, our hurricane that uh, lasted the longest, uh, I think, 16 and a half days uh, that it uh, maintained itself as a tropical cyclone and uh, uh, was a very large storm that created uh, heavy surf that reached both the east coast of North America and some very large waves uh, along the coast of Spain uh, and Portugal. And this is a picture of, um, I believe, Portugal on the uh, bottom here. Uh, there was all kinds of YouTube videos of uh, buildings that were actually being uh, uh, damaged uh, right along the coastline as a result of, uh, of the waves uh, from uh, Leslie. So then once we hit October, uh, we had uh, Michael to deal with. And Michael formed on October 7th, then rapidly intensified as it entered the Gulf of Mexico. And then it became uh, the second and last major hurricane of the season on October 9th. It actually reached a peak intensity of 260 kilometers per hour, and it uh, ended up making landfall uh, as a category five um, hurricane um, uh, along um, uh, near Panama City, Florida. Uh, so near the community of uh, Mexico Beach. Um, so it became the fourth, only the fourth um, um, uh, Category 5 hurricane to make landfall in the U.S. It, would act, it was actually in the books as a, um, at least a preliminary analysis was that it made landfall as a four, but in the post-storm analysis over the course of the winter, looking at all, all the data from the aircraft, the satellite, and some of the surface uh, data uh, for wind speed, uh, they bumped the official wind speed at landfall up by a five miles per hour, which actually bumped it right from a Category 4 to a Category 5. So meteorologically, not a big change. However, historically, uh, certainly a, a significant change there as as uh, it became the fourth category five or uh, five to make landfall in the U.S. So damage was quite widespread all along the coast, um, and uh, the extreme winds caused structural damage uh, with almost uh, 50,000 structures affected. Uh, 3,000 plus of those were destroyed. Uh, the peak winds uh, were that were recorded were 224 kilometers per hour uh, before the sensor failed. Uh, but again, uh, the analysis is that some of the, the winds were actually stronger than that, but 224 is the, the strongest winds that were actually recorded. Um, so it, it's the fourth most powerful hurricane to hit uh, the United States. Uh, and it, uh, it didn't end there. It actually uh, moved into... Uh, into uh, the northern communities of Florida and uh, into Georgia as well. There were 16 uh, direct fatalities. So even even a Category 5 storm making landfall, it was quite remarkable that there were only 16 fatalities. Now, most of those were as a result of the, the, the wind and the storm surge, and estimated costs uh, um, are about uh, $25 billion dollars. Uh, in damages with uh, with Michael. So as uh, October continued, uh, the Nadine formed uh, on October 9th, didn't last very long before it dissipated. And then the final storm of the year was Oscar that formed in late October and actually reached uh, category two hurricane status uh, before weakening. And that was it for the 2018 hurricane season. So it was at the end uh, of the season when all said was when all was said and done. It was slightly more active than the long-term average. Uh, it was the third straight year in which we saw above normal activity, or at least activity that was higher than the long-term average. Um, for here in Canada, um, we had uh, we had one storm, Chris, that uh, impacted Newfoundland as a post-tropical storm, but. Uh, damage was minimal there, and that was it in terms of uh, any imp 
impacts here in Canada. Uh, two storms in particular, Florence and Michael, uh, obviously produced some major impacts in the U.S. So that was it for the season last year. So what might we expect for the 2019 hurricane season? Um, as you may have seen, uh, actually last week, uh, right at about this time, um, NOAA released their uh, hurricane outlook for the 2019 season. Um, there, when when uh, it, it all started, there was just one agency uh, that issued these outlooks for uh, the entire season, and that was Colorado State University and Dr. Bill Gray. He started in the early 80s, and he's um, uh, he continued that on, and then uh, eventually Dr. Phil Klotzbach um, took over his work, and he's continued to issue these uh, outlooks. Uh, NOAA, which is the government in agency in the U.S., uh, actually started a number of years ago as well. Um, so last year, there were something like a, a 21 agencies that actually issued hurricane seasonal outlooks. This year, there are actually 26. So it's a growing number of people throwing their hats into the ring to try and guess how many uh, storms are going to occur over the course of, uh, of the upcoming season. The one that we look at uh, the most is um, Colorado State and, uh, and NOAA. There's a couple other ones that, uh, that are quite uh, um, uh, reliable as well. Uh, but looking at focusing on the NOAA one, um, if we look at the factors in influencing hurricane season this year, uh, in fact, every year, the two most important factors are, as I mentioned, water temperature and uh, wind shear. And uh, uh, that's the two main things that we look at. And then there's some other factors that uh, we look at as well. So if we take a look at water temperature and see where we are with respect to uh, the season, and this is the image I was referring to uh, near the first slide where I had all the tracks, and you can see that it correlates very, very well with the formation of tropical cyclones, and this is basically water temperature over the entire uh, um, oceans across uh, the globe, and you can see near the, near the tropics and the equator, uh, where the colors are uh, a darker red and even into the pink is where we have very, very warm water. So if we focus on the Atlantic, this is uh, a map showing the sea surface temperature um, um, over the Atlantic and into the Gulf of St. Lawrence. This was uh, the one that I showed uh, you last year, right about this time. So this is a sea surface temperature uh, last year, so if I move ahead and look at uh, what we uh, what we're looking at uh, now, uh, basically looking at uh, sea surface temperature. If I go back to last year, to this year, last year, this year, we're starting off with water temperature that's actually a little warmer than what we saw last year. Uh, so that's an interesting point as well. So I'll just go back last year and this year. So the shading at least in the tropics, are a little redder, meaning that the water is a little bit warmer than where we were at approximately this time last year. If we look at how that compares to the average, well, we see that just off the coast of Canada, the water is uh, significantly uh, colder than average, which is not surprising given the uh, spring, terrible spring that we've been having here. Um, but as you move further south along the mid-Atlantic states and down into the Gulf of Mexico, the water is actually a little bit warmer than average, which is, again, fairly typical for this time of the year. That's ten, where we tend to see is some the water being a little bit more, uh, warmer than average, which is why this is typically where we start to see the first storm of the year, which we actually have already. Uh, the other important area is just off the coast of Africa, and you can see that there's a cold pool of water just off the coast of Africa where temperature, water temperatures are about a degree below average. Uh, but as you see in some subsequent slides here, um, that is something that is most likely going to change over the course of the hurricane season. So this is water temperature anomaly with the with the yellows being warmer uh, than average and the blue being a little bit colder than average. So what we expect is that that area off the coast of Africa is going to uh, warm up um, at least somewhat over the course of uh, the next few months, uh, as it usually does uh, over the course of the summer. Uh, 
Uh, but if we compare that with the long-term average, we're probably that that area of colder water is probably going to disappear, and uh, it may become close to average or potentially even slightly above average. So the component or the factor that going to influence this year's hurricane season. If we're looking at water temperature, we're probably looking at a little more active if we were just looking at water temperature. The other thing we need to look at is wind shear. So why is wind shear important? Um, when, when these hurricanes develop, they need fairly constant wind, light wind, and very little change in the wind direction or speed as you go up in the atmosphere. So whenever you uh, have um, some wind shear in the atmosphere, or in other words, a, a large uh, difference in wind speed or direction as you go up in the atmosphere, uh, these towers that I showed earlier, uh, when I showed the cross section of a hurricane, they have a hard time really developing because the storm actually gets sheared apart before it can really acquire any significant amount of uh, intensity. Uh, so one of the things that we look at for wind shear is whether or not we have an El Nino. So when we have an El Nino, the subtropical jet stream, um, which is basically a band of, of uh, winds at the higher levels of the atmosphere, tends to be stronger. So you end up with um, stronger winds that blow from west to east at the top of the atmosphere, and the reason we have an El Nino in the first place is because the trade winds, which are the winds uh, that blow from the east in the lower levels of the atmosphere, are stronger. So because of that, whenever we have an El Nino, we tend to have more wind shear over the tropics in general, which means uh, fewer uh, hurricanes. Uh, so when we're looking at El Nino, we're looking at water temperature in that larger um, a rectangle in the Pacific. So again, this is uh, this is water temperature um, both in the Pacific and Atlantic, and you can see those two boxes. Uh, this again was around this time last year, and you can see in the Pacific there are some patches of warm, but there's also some patches of colder. So on average, we were we were we were neither warmer, we were slightly warmer than average, but not enough to actually call it an El Nino. So we were in a neutral condition last year as we went into hurricane season. If you look at the water temperature off the coast of uh, Africa, and you can see that large area of blue, uh, so the water was significantly colder than average at this time last year. So if we go ahead and look at where we were from May of last year, to April of this year, you can see that that air, first of all, that area in the Atlantic uh, is uh, not quite as blue as it was back last year. So that area is not quite as cold. However, the area in the Pacific is certainly a lot uh, warmer, meaning that it, it is an El Nino condition and we entered an El Nino at least a weak one towards the end of uh, last fall. So we're presently in a weak El Nino situation. So this was last year, this was uh, about a month and a half ago, and this is now. So you can see that area in blue in the Atlantic is really starting to disappear, which uh, lends credence to the, the thought process that that water is actually warming and will continue to warm over the course of the summer. As for the El Nino, well, let's see what's going to happen. This is a plot of uh, temperature anomaly in that bigger um, square that's in the Pacific. So right now we're somewhere between uh, 0 0.5 and 1 degree above average temperature-wise. So we need the water temperature in that big rectangle to be uh, warmer, the anomaly to be more than 0.5 degrees Celsius. Anything above 0.5 means that we're in an El Nino. And these lines are all essentially uh, plots of the projected water temperature anomaly in that big rectangle over the coming months. That um, this larger uh, red rectangle here is essentially the, the peak of hurricane season. So most of the models that try and predict El Nino are calling for a continued weak El Nino over the course of uh, hurricane season. 
uh, even though there's a couple of models in there that actually predict that it, we might move back towards a neutral situation, so that adds some uncertainty to the forecast. If we look at the official uh, forecast uh, for the El Nino for this year, we're looking at about a 60% probability that will be in El Nino conditions during the peak of hurricane season, uh, only about 35% chance of uh, neutral conditions, and only a 5% chance that will be in uh, La Nina, which is the opposite of, uh, of uh, El Nino, and that would mean colder water in that larger rectangle. So looking at, at now wind shear, because we're expected to be in an El Nino condition over the course of hurricane season, that contribution would tend to suppress hurricane activity. So we're expecting that water, level, water temperature is going to be slightly warmer, but wind shear is going to be slightly higher than average, um, which would tend to kind of counteract the, the warmer water effect. Now the thing is with wind shear is that even in a season where you have overall uh, average higher wind shear, there's always these little pockets that develop that where the wind shear actually relaxes. So this is uh, just an indication of last year, the average wind shear over the tropics in the Atlantic um, from August 15th uh, all the way into uh, October, and you can see the red areas are areas where the wind shear was higher than average, uh, which is indicative of the fact that we were moving towards that weak El Nino. The bluer areas are areas where the wind shear is uh, below average for that stretch. So there are always these pockets where the wind shear drops uh, to below average, and that opens up the door for these tropical cyclones, these hurricanes to develop and potentially become uh, uh, catastrophic storms. And this is what we saw last year. And it, you can kind of see that uh, the, the pattern here really, um, really mirrors the track of Florence and even, uh, even Michael. You can see that once the, the storm, at least Michael moved into the Gulf of uh, Mexico where the water is a lot warmer, it also moved into an area of lower shear which allowed it to intensify to the uh, extent that it did. So the last thing we look at is whether or not we're in what we call a uh, active phase and and what we've identified over the last uh, number of years is what we call a multi-decadal cycle and that's essentially a situation where um, we're where we can observe a, uh, an increase and a decrease in the level of hurricane activity on the, on the order of about 20 to 40 years. So we've seen uh, periods of multiple decades where we've had lots of hurricane activity followed by another period with below average uh, activity. So <clears throat> what, we've, what we know is that we are currently in an active period and we have been since 1995. There were some indications maybe a couple of years ago that we might be uh, leaving that active phase. However, the last three seasons, once again, have been more active than the long-term average. So until we get a, a large number of seasons in a row uh, where, um, where we're seeing less than normal activity, we have to assume that we're still in that active phase. So because of that, we're thinking that that contribution is going to be uh, towards more storms. So pulling it all together, uh, NOAA again issued their outlook uh, last week uh, at this time, and what they're calling for is nine to 15 named storms, uh, four to eight of those reaching hurricane status, and then two to four of those four to eight hurricanes making it to major hurricane status. And they actually tie a um, percentage to, <clears throat> excuse me, whether we're going to see an above normal or um, below normal or near normal. So what they're looking at is a 40% chance that, you know, it's going to be near normal and about an equal chance, 30% that it could be above or below. And I think the main player in where that actually swings, whether, whether it does go uh, above or below, uh, is going to be what, uh, what El Nino does. Uh, if it really relaxes and then the shear starts to drop, then we're probably uh, edging more towards a, a slightly above normal season. Uh, 
Uh, if the waters don't warm up and we maintain a weak El Nino, then we might uh, be more towards the lower end of uh, the spectrum. So, uh, so that is what is predicted for this year. Uh, of course, uh, we've uh, had our first storm of the season uh, last week. Um, it developed as a subtropical storm. It didn't have any impacts. It just stayed over the uh, over, over the ocean and it didn't even last a day. It formed and then it dissipated. Uh, however, this is the fifth year in a row that we've had a storm develop prior to the official start of the season. Typically, we see a storm start before um, uh, a storm develop before the uh, June 1st start of the season once every four years. It's now been five years in a row that we've seen uh, storms develop pre-June uh, 1st. So that was Andrea. The next one on the list will be Barry, uh, followed by Chantal, Dorian, Aaron, and so on. <clears throat> so this again is the list that uh, we're going to be using this year. Uh, this is something that I show uh, pretty much every year as well, and this is um, basically a graph showing the number of storms that enter our response zone compared to the total number of storms in the Atlantic Basin. And if we average that out over a 30 year period, we, we can see that there's a, about 32% of named storms in the Atlantic find their way into our Canadian Hurricane Center response zone. That 30 to 35% um, on average has been, uh, that, that 30 year average has been fairly constant over, over that period. Uh, but in the last 10 years or so, we can see that there's, there's, a, there's a quite a wider variation from year to year as to the percentage of the storms that make it into our response zone. I, I don't think uh, we can necessarily read in, into anything uh, on that just yet, but it's uh, an interesting thing that uh, we're going to be looking at in future years to see if there continues to be that much uh, variability. So the last thing uh, quickly to go over is just, uh, uh, again, some of the websites to look at over the course of the season to get uh, information on uh, actual storms that are out there. Um, the National Hurricane Center in Miami, they issue a suite of products um, uh, looking at storm surge. Um, again, the storm surge stuff is just for the U.S., but uh, they issue their tropical weather outlooks, which is a, a product that's issued during the uh, hurricane season that's updated every six hours showing any potential areas of development. Once the storm actually does develop, <coughs> there's a suite of products that they have, including track maps and uh, wind probability maps, time of arrival of tropical storm force winds. Um, and they've, they've added a number of new products over the years, again, like the storm surge, the flood risk, uh, uh, inundation maps, and uh, their key messages that uh, that we're kind of uh, adopting as well uh, for we have over the past years and we'll continue to do so um, uh, assuming we do get storms here. So whenever a storm is out over the Atlantic but is not expected to have an immediate impact on Canada, the place to go is that website, the National Hurricane uh, Center website. Um, once, a, once we kind of get an idea that a storm may have an impact uh, on Canada, uh, that's where you can start uh, kind of migrating to the Canadian Hurricane Center products. This is where we have our, our track map and our, our uh, information bulletins. Uh, we've just unveiled a new uh, weather app uh, this year that can be downloaded from the App Store or Google Play uh, that will have the uh, tropical cyclone information, uh, the hurricane maps on there as well. Uh, we're also looking at, um, at uh, quite... Uh, possibly starting up a uh, Twitter account, uh, possibly even on the first day of hurricane season. So that's kind of in the works. Uh, we hope to get that through by June 1st, which is just a couple of days away. Um, so that'll be, uh, we'll have information on there as well. Um, so that's pretty much what I had for this year's uh, briefing. Uh, and I guess uh, one of the things that we, we always say is you you don't necessarily make your preparations based on the predictions for the entire season uh, because one of the things is that we can typically get a pretty good idea of the level of activity over the entire Atlantic Ocean Basin uh, 
However, we're not able to say exactly where those storms are gonna go once they do form. And with uh, a prediction of uh, four to eight hurricanes and two to four of them potentially becoming major hurricanes, um, you definitely don't wanna be impacted by one of those. So regardless of what the prediction is for the entire season, as we always say, it only takes one to make it a bad year. So with that, I guess we can open it up to uh, any questions. Thanks so much, Bob. That was great. Very informative. I learned a lot myself. Um, so if you, uh, I'll open the floor to uh, attendees. Uh, if you have any questions, please use the tool at the bottom of the screen. I'm going to start off, uh, Bob, with a question. You talked about classification of hurricane. And there's been a lot of talk about uh, how we should incorporate storm surge into classification because most people die from surge and not from wind. I was wondering what your thoughts were on that and what might such a system look like if, if they went in that way? Well, it's, it's an interesting discussion because um, it, the, as I said earlier, we need an objective uh, way to actually classify these storms. And the only thing that is directly um, uh, related to the storm itself um, or the the uh, the only hazard itself that is directly related to the storm is wind. There is pressure. We can measure pressure as well, but that could be that could be somewhat uh, misleading um, in terms of trying to convey the intensity of the storm. So, uh, wind is really the only thing that we have to uh, objectively classify these storms in uh, in the same manner. Uh, what tends to be forgotten is that um, storm surge was actually embedded into the Saffir Simpson scale years ago. They had tried that uh, many years ago to attach a storm surge value to a particular category of storm. Um, but that's where it gets you know, more complicated than, than people can understand because the storm surge value that you get at a particular location is not only dependent on the intensity of the storm, it depends on other outside factors. So you could have the same storm occurring at, at different locations and producing an entirely different um, storm surge. So back in 2010, storm surge was actually removed from the Saffir Simpson scale. So it, it appears nowhere in the Saffir Simpson scale. And a lot of the discussions that are going around now is to include rainfall in the Saffir Simpson scale, uh, which again would just muddy the waters in terms of trying to um, determine the intensity of a storm. Uh, I think what is what is a more appropriate discussion to have is if we have a separate um, kind of warning system for um, you know the threat of heavy rainfall events, because you can get situations where you can you can get this heavy rain occurring but it's not even attached to a named storm. So in that case, what do you do? So that's where I think in terms of a, of a, of a discussion around communicating these uh, hazards is to have a kind of a separate um, classification system for, for weather events rather than just focus on the hurricanes because we need to maintain that, that, that objectivity when we're classifying these things. So. Uh, trying to complicate the Saffir Simpson scale is not the answer when we're trying to uh, convey these hazards. It's largely a communications problem. Interesting. Now, on that same note, um, I think you noted there's only been five, I think, Cat 5 landfalls in U.S. history, something like that. There has also been talk about, you know, do we need a Cat 6 on the Saffir Simpson scale? Is that semantics? Um, is that going too far? I, I think it is because uh, when we're talking about, um, you know, a category five and you, you can, if you think back of that picture that I showed of the coastline of, um, of the Florida Panhandle after, uh, after Michael, uh, you can see that there's actually nothing left there. So once you reach a category five, it's pretty much total destruction of in, everything in its path. So, so I would have to see some very concrete evidence uh, 
um, uh, showing that people would uh, react differently to uh, something called a Category 6 storm as, as opposed to a Category 5. That would change their behavior. Interesting. Uh, we have one question online here. Uh, what is the long-term trend for post-tropical storms making landfall in Canada? Um, I haven't seen some some long-term trends uh, related to that because not every not every tropical storm actually transforms itself into a a post-tropical storm. Um, so I don't think that uh, that there are any trends upward or downward. Uh, in the number of uh, post-tropical storms um, making uh, making landfall in Canada. Okay, thank you. Um, I think there probably has to be an obligatory question about climate change, of course. Um, <laughs> where are we with the science? I mean, I, uh, despite what we hear, despite a lot of hyperbole, uh, I don't think we're seeing more storms. I don't think we're seeing necessarily stronger storms. I think there's been some new research that uh, hurricanes are speeding up a little bit, very, very minutely. Um, but we're just not seeing it in the data yet. But uh, what is, what's your take on the on the latest science of climate change in the uh, North Atlantic hurricane? Yeah, if we I actually attended a conference um, in uh, New Orleans back in uh, in the late spring, where where that came up to kind of take a look at where the science was at that particular time, and. Uh, what uh, what they still talked about is essentially if we look at the number of storms uh, in a warmer climate, uh, it might be a little bit counterintuitive because if we if we're thinking of a warmer climate, we're thinking of uh, of uh, warmer atmosphere and a warmer ocean. You'd think necessarily that oh okay we're probably going to see more um, you know tropical cyclones, but if you look at it globally. On average, what it shows is a reduction in the number of storms. Um, however, some of the higher end storms, like a like a uh, Hurricane Michael, that you may see uh, some of those storms actually reach a slightly higher intensity. Uh, so, essentially, it was: Are storms going to get uh, stronger as a result of climate change? The answer was yes. Then the follow-up question was, okay, but how? By how much? And that's where it gets a little bit more complicated because some of the numbers that were that were communicated to us was that you'd probably be looking at about a three percent increase in the overall intensity of storms. However, we're only able to actually measure the intensity of a given storm within ten percent of that intensity. So, is that three percent? Um, significant or not that uh, remains to be the question so um, so essentially fewer storms but they might be a little bit more intense now the other question is really related to its forward motion there have been a couple of papers over um, uh, last year to year and a half that would suggest that the storms are potentially slowing down well, that's not good news when it comes to these heavy rainfall events, because if you remember Harvey two years ago, that was a result of uh, the storm actually slowing down and basically coming on, becoming almost stationary and dumping about 1,600 millimeters of rain uh, in the southern part of Texas. And then if you look at Florence from last year, again, that was a storm that slowed down significantly just before making landfall and, uh, you know, dumped over uh, 900 millimeters of rain. So if, in fact, these storms do start slowing down, there's a higher risk for uh, more of these, you know, significant uh, flooding events as a result of, uh, of the rainfall with tropical cyclones. Right. Uh, similar question. Uh how is our understanding of El Nino coming along? Do we do we have a better understanding of what drives El Nino? I, I've written about it years ago, and, and I know there, there at that time wasn't a very good understanding of what mechanisms caused this pooling of of water off of South America. Do we have a better understanding of, of El Nino? Well, it's uh, it, it's it, the the main cause is is a strengthening of those uh, tropical trade winds, so the easterly trade winds. Um, so basically when we have, um, 
uh, or or a reduction in the uh, in the trade winds, depending on 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 what condition you're looking at. So when those when the trade winds are stronger in the um, Pacific, that tends to push the wa- the warmer water westward, allowing that cold water to come up, and then that's a more uh, either a a neutral or a La Nina type situation. However, if those trade winds relax, then you don't have that upwelling, and then the water, that warmer water, tends to pool um, uh, in place for an extended period of time, which is which is why we see that warmer and colder fluctuation in the water temperature in that big rectangle that I showed earlier. So it's a, it, it's related to the increase and decrease over a long period of time of the trade winds in that part of uh, the Pacific Ocean. Great. Um, let me remind everybody, please use the, uh, the Q&A tool at the bottom of the screen. I only, we've only had one online question so far, so please feel free to, to submit more questions. I'm going to run out of my own pretty soon. Um, Getting back to the whole trend question, uh, we, we don't see any firm trends in, I don't think, in the North Atlantic Basin. Uh, but over the last couple of years, we've seen a fairly, uh, a, a number of remarkable situations in the Pacific with typhoon, uh, you know, four major storms at once, things of this nature. Is that true? Are we seeing any changes in, in that basin? And when you compare the two basins, or, you know, or, is there any marked difference in, in, in trend? Or? Um. <clears throat> Basically, there has been more activity in the Pacific. That's uh, that's true. And then, uh, if we look at it overall, so including all the basins, not just the Atlantic and the Pacific, but the uh, Indian Ocean as well, um, um, the, there, it's really difficult to see any kind of upward trend there, in the at least the frequency of storms. What tends to complicate things a little bit is. The, the satellite image that I showed earlier, which is our uh, high resolution uh, GO-16 uh, satellite, there's a uh, GO-16 has a, um, a Western counterpart uh, called GO-17 uh, that sees kind of the Western part of the U.S. and into the into uh, that part of, of the uh, Pacific, whereas GO-16 sees the Eastern part of North America and into the Atlantic. Those satellite um, uh, images that we get from these satellites are so high resolution that we're, it's a lot easier to detect these storms now than they were just a few years ago. So what we have as a database, even though the database for, for hurricanes, as I mentioned earlier, goes back to 1842, really you, you have to have enough data within that satellite area, uh, era um, to really get a good idea of what we were seeing back then compared to what we're seeing now. Um, so, um, you know, so the record really that we have that is really credible starts at about 1980. So that's, that's kind of where we were. And in that period, we were in a, uh, in the, in the lower activity phase of that multi decadal cycle. So we've gone from within that, uh, time frame where we're a lot better at detecting these storms. We've gone from a, um, a, a low activity phase to a high activity phase, and we've gotten a lot better at detecting the storms. So if you eliminate that sort of uh, artificial upward trend, it's about it's about a flat line in terms of the, the frequency of these storms. And a good example is Andrea from last week. Uh, I'm not sure without goes. Um, 16 that 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 storm would actually have become a named storm so that just goes to show how you know we're detecting storms now that we didn't just a few years ago so can you tell us a little bit more about goes um what other ways are you getting improved data and, and what else can the can goes do that the previous satellites could not do well <clears throat> The, the resolution, first of all, is a lot better, both uh, spatial resolution and the time resolution. So we're seeing uh, satellite images um, at a much uh, higher frequency um, than we did before. So we're, we're able to see a very smooth evolution of these storms as they develop. There's a number of different imagers on those satellites that... Uh, that allow us to see things like uh, increase in uh, lightning, which could be an in, uh, indication that the that a tropical cyclone is intensifying. 
Uh, there are things that allow us to see uh, on, on different satellites that allow us to see um, uh, an estimate or give us an estimate of wind speed over the water. And this is, it's done by uh, measuring the, uh, uh, the characteristics of the ripples on the water. So as long as uh, an area is, uh, doesn't have extremely heavy rainfall, just the skin of the ocean, the ripples on the water, can be detected by a satellite and you can get to infer winds and wind speed from that. So not only wind speed, but wind direction. So we're able to get an idea of the circulation and the intensity of the circulation over the water from a satellite, which is quite remarkable. Amazing stuff. Um, so you talked about, Andrea, you talked about fifth year in a row with uh, storms beginning earlier than June 1st. Uh, is that an omen for anything? Does it mean anything? Um, I actually uh, read uh, an article on that last week, and it's it's not necessarily uh, uh, an indication of anything that, uh, um, that we might see in the future. Um, one interesting thing was, uh, I think, about three or four years ago, where we actually saw a hurricane in the month of January, uh, in the eastern part of the Atlantic, uh, it ended up uh, impacting the Azores. Uh, that was a bit of an anomaly and probably more of a, an indication of the previous hurricane season than, the, than that current year's uh, hurricane season. Um, it, we've seen seasons that have been quite busy when we've had storms early uh, before the start of the uh, hurricane season and we've seen the opposite as well. It's pretty much 50-50 in terms of if we get a storm before uh, the start of the season, whether we get um, a busy season or not. So it's really not an indicator of a bad season when you get uh, one or two storms before June 1st. And it may actually be more, uh, uh, especially in, in more recent years, it may be more of an artifact of the new satellite images um, than, than any kind of trend. But it's going to be something to uh, uh, pay attention to, I think, in, in the coming years if we keep getting storms before June 1st. Right. Now, if um, so with GO-16, we're going to perhaps be able to detect storms that we probably couldn't have detected even just a few years ago. That's going to skew the data. Is there a way of cleaning up the data so that we can make comparisons over the past? Yeah, there's some work that's actually being done on that, not necessarily to to eliminate storms that we are going to that we can see now and that we're going to see in the future, but there's some work being done to try and estimate the number of storms that were missed in in the earlier years. I'm not sure how far back they want to try and and go with that, but at that conference that I was at in uh, New Orleans, they did mention that there was some work that had begun to try and estimate year by year the number of storms that may have been missed based on some of the other factors that uh, that were present for that hurricane season. I'm not sure exactly uh, exactly what kind of work is being done and what factors they're looking at, but there's something uh, there's there's some work being done to look at to try and estimate how many storms that were missed in previous years, which which should uh, actually provide kind of a more homogeneous database of of hurricanes over the over that period right so i mean are you know are things like machine learning artificial intelligence being incorporated into some of this work um i haven't read anything on that uh, whether whether some of that is being incorporated into that or not okay um Again, uh, to listeners, if you have questions, please use the tool. We've only got one question so far, so I'm going to be running out of questions very, very <laughs> shortly. Um, Bob, Hurricane Hazel 1954 hit southern Ontario. It was, uh, it was a heck of an event, and to this day we use it as the, as the, uh, as the design um, for, for stormwater and, and flood management in southern Ontario. That was a bit of an oddball storm. Um, you know, what... What drives an event like that? What, what, you know, we, we, we once in a while we'll get a, 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 a subtropical or post-tropical storm getting up into southern Ontario, southern Quebec. It's not too often, but, uh, you know, I mean, I don't even know what I'm asking you, but, um, but, you know, what, what causes a storm to direct up to the central, uh, up 
through the central uh, uh, continent in that way. And, you know, um, I, I, yeah, don't know. I mean, any thoughts on that? Yeah, a lot of these storms that we see come up uh, into um, that part of Canada, even that part of the U.S., um, a lot of them come in um, from storms that make landfall in the Gulf of Mexico and then come up. There have been a number of wind events in uh, southern uh, Ontario and, and southern Quebec that have resulted from storms that have made landfall somewhere on the Gulf Coast of the U.S. and then become post-tropical. And the, a lot of the storms that we see that actually end up causing a whole lot of damage um, particularly in areas east of uh, Atlantic or west of Atlantic Canada <clears throat> uh, and for Atlantic Canada too, uh, for that matter, is a storm that becomes post-tropical but then re-intensifies, like a Sandy, like a Noel. Those storms um, re-intensified after it, they became post-tropical. So that's why that's why we tend to, to you know tell people. Don't read into don't read in uh, yeah, read anything into the term post tropical. Um, one of the things that we've heard over the years is that the term post tropical makes it sound like it's done, it's after the fact, and it's not the case. It's just a, a storm that is no longer tropical, but could still be fairly damaging in terms of a uh, of a storm. What we also see sometimes as well is that tropical system either feeding um, another separate storm center, uh, which was the case with uh, Hazel, um, and and kind of interacting with that um, with that second system or independent system to become uh, a very strong system. And again, that's what we saw with uh, Hazel. Uh, another example of that is the heavy rainfall event that we saw here in Cape Breton um, a couple of years ago. Uh, where it was related to a, a, a totally independent storm, but it, that storm was fed by moisture from Hurricane uh, Matthew and uh, parts of Cape Breton and uh, southwestern Newfoundland got over 250 millimeters of rain in about a 12-hour period, which um, not too many systems are designed to handle that amount of rain in that short period of time. So what we see in our neck of the woods is a storm that becomes post-tropical, re-intensifies, or that interacts with a totally different storm to result in some of the impacts that we see here. Interesting. Um, I have one question left and, and that's about it. But in, in past uh, forecasts, uh, we have talked about um, improvements in forecasting the path of these storms and, and lessening that cone of uncertainty. Is there any progress going on in, in that area? Yeah, and once again this year, uh, the the cone is going to be uh, a little bit smaller than it was uh, last year. That trend is continuing, so we're, we're constantly getting better at forecasting the track of these storms. However, we're still, the, like I mentioned earlier, that the one of the the big problems for forecasters remains forecasting the intensity. We're not seeing that improvement in forecasting the, the intensity of tropical cyclones, particularly rapidly intensifying tropical cyclones, than we are seeing with the track of, uh, uh, of the storm. So uh, the cone will be a little bit smaller this year. And, and just to, to give you uh, a heads up on that, I think I mentioned uh, maybe in some of the previous briefings that the Hurricane Center in Miami is for the last number of years now, they've been doing some internal testing to come up with a seven-day track. So right now, the track extends up to five days, um, but and they've been doing this uh, testing for a few years now. Um, and now they're at the point where the day seven uh, position, albeit still a large area, error, we're still talking over 400 kilometers, but the errors involved in forecasting the position of a storm seven days out is on par with what the error was in forecasting the day five position when the day five forecast was introduced back in 2001. So we're at that point now where, um, where pretty soon we're going to see that hurricane track extending out to seven days. 
um, as opposed to just five days, which it is now. Now that's not going to occur this year, uh, perhaps not even next year, but I would not be surprised to see that uh, two years from now, which is going to actually, if you think about it, it's going to have a fairly significant impact on on Canada because the end of that track, and again, we're talking errors over 400 kilometers, the end of that track is going to start showing up in Canada if a storm is headed this way two days earlier than what it used to be before. So there's a lot of attention that uh, that is focused on these storms. If you start showing the track coming up into Canada two days before it does now, that's going to that's gonna ramp everything up, the media and the social media and all that, uh, just two days earlier. So it's, it's, it's going to have a significant impact on, on how we deal with these storms here at the Canadian Hurricane Center. Oh, very good. Interesting. Okay, well, that's it for my questions. We don't have any on the online system, so I guess we'll wrap it up for today. Bob, I want to thank you so much for this again. It was excellent, very informative. Um, we will have a uh, video replay of this event on our uh, YouTube channel very shortly. And again, uh, tomorrow, Friday, May 31st, 1 p.m. Eastern Time, tune in to our regular Friday forum, uh, Modeling a Future Flood Risk Across Canada Under Climate Change, uh, and check your inboxes for the link and all that. Again, uh, thanks so much, Bob. Uh, thank you for your help, Tracy, and uh, let's wrap it up.